Hey, this is Rob Swanson with The Real Estate Mogul Show. Let's get into it. What's up, everybody? Rob Swanson here, back with another episode of The Real Estate Mogul Show. We are back in the studio after an action-packed week of... I don't know, having some fun. Uh, it's been the 4th of July last week, and, um, you know, that just kind of throws a wrench into the middle of the week as people dispersed and going different directions, and it creates some good stories and yeah. some fun times. So uh, with that, um, what I want to tell you is that this show, we are going to get into a conversation about virtual investing. So remote market investing, virtual market investing. And I want to let you know that we are starting to take enrollments in our upcoming virtual market challenge. So we're going to dive in on that topic here today. We're going to talk to you about why would you even consider investing somewhere outside of where you live? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? Why is it even a thing? Uh, I can tell you I've been doing it for over 20 years, and it has formed my investment thesis and the whole approach that I take to real estate investing. So before we dive into that, I've got the crew sitting here in the studio again. Uh, let's just jump around the room and say a quick hello. What's happening in your worlds? I'm going first today. <laughs> Fired up. <laughs> uh, you just cut me in line. <laughs> no, it was a, it was a great week. Um did uh 4th of july down at my buddy's new house we were actually across the street from you i didn't tell you this but we were in red rocks ranch across from yep. bandemir you were there and i watched the fireworks from across the highway yes so, we were yep so that was fun and uh then on actual 4th of july um we live in a neighborhood of a bunch of firework enthusiasts <laughs> and uh we sat um on the front sidewalk in front of our house in camp chairs and we you could look everywhere and there were just like gunpowder like sprinkling down on our roof and stuff <laughs> it was like great. it yeah it was good nice cool mike what's happening well henry already told my story but <laughs> we went to uh fill in some details jet car nationals with the kiddos at the uh Bandemir speedway so the drag racing rest in peace track yeah final final season final year heard they're looking for dirt but as of right now they're shutting it down so it's the last one we'll be back there uh in not very long for the final top fuel drag racing <laughs> event of the of this track 65 years and they're shutting it down wow because uh henry's friends that live across the highway <laughs> complain <laughs> about the noise <laughs> that's probably so, true that's yeah. honestly true yeah so that was good great great show uh, really fun. Went with a couple of friends, and then um, trying to think. Do we do we barbecued Monday night? We barbecued Tuesday, Fourth of July. Mm -hmm. Fireworks wore the kids out. They're still trying to recover. Hmm. I like it. Yep. You know it's crazy. That reminds me a little bit of the fight that airports always have with communities, right? Yep. So airports are quote unquote loud. I mean, I I live a little bit north of of the airport. It, you know, kind of right in the corridor where airplanes are leaving and coming into a fairly big, big, busy class Delta airport in the north side of Denver. And my house is right underneath that entrance exit path. And I got to be honest with you, I enjoy it. Like, I guess as a pilot, I'm always looking up and thinking, mm -hmm. I wonder what that airplane is. I know what they're going through in the cockpit right now. Oh, they probably just got transitioned mm -hmm. out of the airspace or just got, you know, clearance into the airspace or whatever the case may be. I kind of enjoy it. And I think how like how can it be so annoying to people? Right. And so the, the other piece of that before I bounce it to Joe to say what's up is it, it drives me crazy. The airport's been there forever. And then people move in. Right. And. You know, Karen gets all bent out of shape about, <laughs> you know, the noise know above her head, it, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden she thinks that she owns the airspace and she owns this this area. Wait a minute. You moved in <laughs> in the last two years. The airport's been there for 50. That one's right? cool, too, because you see a bunch of cool planes flying in and out of You that. do see a we lot were, of good We planes. were going down into Boulder on Tuesday, and I don't know what it was. It wasn't a private 
a plane or anything like that. I think they were doing flyovers like uh, over the stadium for Fourth of July, and he took this huge mean turn into that uh, valley on the other side of the flat irons there. It was really cool to watch because nice. we were just going down the highway and you could see him do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. People are crazy. People are crazy. Yeah. 60, Joe, what's sixty-five years the racetrack's been there? Yeah. Dang. Whatever. That's nuts. I know. Joe, what's up? I'm doing good. I'm uh, um, excited about uh, our new little setup. I'm I'm on the other side of that wall that you see the uh, hexes on, and so we put a little uh, production desk over here and uh, it's pretty pretty fun um, but I am I have to say I'm pretty inspired by all this challenge and and progression that people are going through um, here in the hundred offer challenge the upcoming virtual market challenge so I thought to myself well, what can I do to challenge myself so I'm on an eight-day streak on Duolingo learning Spanish I mean I've you know had Spanish experience in the past but I've never like really committed to it when I was a cop I had Hola. To, <laughs> Hola, ¿cómo estás? <coughs> uh-huh. Gracias, señor. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> but oh, wait, uh, and it's señor. <laughs> it's not great. senior, senior. Maybe I'll add you on Duolingo, and we can work on it together. But eight day streak. I'm pretty stoked on it. Um, uh, also, uh, what else is happening? Um, I mean, that's pretty much it. Fourth of July was fun. Just spent it with you know friends. Uh, down southern denver and um uh got rained on super hard on the way back home um you know we're watching some fireworks pop off and then all of a sudden it is you can't see anything out the window because it was all just just uh crazy rain but yeah fun well i think that that same thing happened to me i didn't I, i'm gonna be honest with you guys i didn't see a single fireworks this fourth of july not one i heard a couple I didn't see one because every time they were shooting off where I was was like full on fog and overcast and like raining. Oh, wow. It was crazy. We, we were up in the Black Hills up in South Dakota and it was like it, it would go from blue skies to just overcast and downpour and hail and wow. crazy. And then we drove back to Denver. And by the time we got back to Denver, um, it was like literally maybe 100 feet above my house was this layer of just gunk hanging hanging there and yeah. it was low clouds it was crazy did you guys camp did you get a airbnb or something yeah we camped yeah it was nice cool we, we, yeah we had a good time you so got we, some pictures up there too rob you can show oh yeah that's right um yeah uh throw you can throw that up there now th- now this is not our black hills trip the picture that's uh oh. likely up on the screen this is actually up on the snake river in wyoming earlier in the week we were up in uh jackson hole wyoming with some friends doing a little mastermind up there and uh early morning uh trevor mock from carrot and myself uh, went out onto the Snake River, and uh, we both, neither one of us got skunked on the snake. I think I said that last week, but yeah. uh, we uh, we both pulled out some uh, some fish, and it was a, it was a good time. Uh, this was a little bit later in the morning. It, the sun had come out. The overcast fog layer had lifted, so I had switched from uh, fishing a little uh, kind of white-ish a uh, cream colored streamer to a black streamer with kind of some big eyes and it was my second cast in this little guy hooked up and we sent him uh we sent him back swimming about 30 seconds later <laughs> nice <laughs> so yeah that was good uh this was uh this was in the black or in the uh Jackson Hole area as well we went out on a little horseback ride that was Where's you your know cowboy hat I know. Where are your boots, Rob? I know. I got tennis shoes on. <laughs> cl- I look like super. <laughs> I look super uh, cowboyish there, yeah. don't I? It's like no flip flops, <laughs> uh, no shorts. It's weird. You it, do have your sunglasses. So yeah. that's par. Yeah. I look wrong. I look wrong in that picture. <laughs> Let me guess. You anti Rob. You showed up in flip flops, and they said not a chance. So you had to change. Yeah, I and I. I got to be honest with you. I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to ride that horse. And I wanted to get it galloping and go, and but I was single file, and so every <laughs> once in a while I tried to pass the guy in front of me, um, and I, I I did accomplish that a few times. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, oh my goodness. Uh, oh yeah, that's uh that's Wilder Ranch. Um, this is where I took a hike on uh, I think Saturday or Sunday nice. um, when you guys were driving up to South Dakota, and it was beautiful out there. 
Cool. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, let's do Beautiful. this. Let's uh, enough of the just minor chit chat in life. Uh, let's let's dive into something. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the idea here is to talk about the virtual market challenge that's coming up and kind of dive into that for people to get an idea of why would you invest outside of where you live? And, you know, we've got some really great instructional content day by day through this challenge and the challenge is free. Anybody can join it. Um, to join it, go to freedomsoft.com forward slash join the challenge and you're going to be able to jump in, join the challenge, and participate with us um, day by day, step by step, through launching your real estate investing business in a virtual market. Now, I don't care if your plan is to be a is to wholesale in that market. I don't care if your plan is to fix and flip in that market. I don't care if your plan is to buy and hold in that market. I really don't care what your exit strategy is in that market. The approach and the process that we that we take to launch into any virtual market is always the same. And we've systematized it, we've processed it, we've done it the same time and time again. We've learned the lessons of what does it take to win and where, where should we make some changes? What have we learned in this market over that market? And I've been doing this for 20 years. And so, um, when I think back to what we had to do 20 years ago to invest virtually versus what we have at our fingertips today, it's astounding. It's, it's amazing to me how simple things are today. Now, I sit here from the lens saying how simple it is with you know, multiple 10,000 hours worth of time thinking about doing real estate investing. So I have that level of expertise uh, that makes real estate investing simple. Back when I was getting started, I was learning things along the way, but I just think about the technology in and of itself and how simple it has become to use technology to our advantage to optimize our real estate investing strategies, whether we're on a cash generation plan or a cash flow creation plan, it really doesn't matter. The technologies and tools that we have available to us today are pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, Google Street View alone, right? Google Street View used to be airplane ticket. Multiple <laughs> right. days, show up, rent a car, and go look right. at it. I, I remember when Google Street View first was introduced, like literally first introduced, and I, and I want to say that it was like 2009, 2010, somewhere right around in there. And I remember the real estate investing world going crazy. Was about it bad? It. No, it was awesome. It worked? It was amazing. Mm. It was insane. It was, cr it was, you could, for the first time, you could get a picture of a neighborhood somewhere halfway across the, the country in a market you were interested in investing in, maybe a house that was a lead that you got in, you could literally go on to Google, pull up the street view, and look at the house. Now, the same challenges existed back then that exist today. Sometimes it's an older picture. Sometimes, you know, there's there's always little, you know, variables that come into play. But it was game changing to Completely. the speed and the availability of data and information into a real estate investor's world. Yep. In an instant now. I, I remember being amazed. Now we just take it for granted. I remember the first time I saw it, I'm like, really? They're going to drive every street in America with a camera on the top? Okay. And, and that's they what they did. did. <laughs> yeah. And some of the real big advantage, let's just be honest, you can't get shot at through Google Street View, depending on where the property is. That's right. That's, That's right. Super important. <laughs> I've, right? I've seen him going around on like a motorcycle or a scooter and the guy's got it on, on his helmet at this point now. That's how they get pictures of like the more country roads, hmm. like the dirt roads. No kidding. It's pretty, cr it's pretty crazy. Wow. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I've seen the little cars. Yeah. But I suppose they've just said, hey, we get, let's try to figure out how to be a little bit more cost efficient or cost effective. 
And I, I don't even know how that works. I don't know if those are people are Google employees or if they're contractors that get hired to go drive certain routes. I don't know really how that works, but um, I, I've always seen like what you were talking about, Mike. The yeah, I've only seen the car, the frame with the car, yeah, yeah, yeah. or the car with the frame on it, and then the cam the round camera and the up on top. Three sixty cameras, three sixty cams. Yeah, in the Bay Area where I was uh, living before, um, they had self driving cars. So they had self driving cars that would drive around and take those pictures. Really? Yeah. <laughs> the world yeah. we're living in. Totally. Then the first time I saw the 360 video on YouTube, it was a uh, Blue Angels pilot, and he's flying formation. With uh, and he's the he's the pilot in the middle, and then you can move the camera in any direction. Wow! And then the, you know they took it from the Google Street View, however that gets patched together. And then I remember years ago I saw this video. It's like you got to be kidding. Yeah. I mean, it's like I'm you know it's not like you're sitting in the plane, but the the view is. Well, well, Google Street View, right? That's that's one thing. Um, what about like public record access? I, that's what I was going to say next. Like just building a list, like just uh, like getting the data to say, okay, I want to invest outside of Denver. And we're going to circle back in a minute and say, why would I even want to? Why would I want to invest outside of Denver? But let's let's say that I'm living in Denver and let's say that I want to invest in Memphis, Tennessee. And I but I don't know anything about Memphis, Tennessee. I've never been in Memphis, Tennessee. I don't know where the action is. I don't know where investors are making money. I don't know how they're making money. I don't know the neighborhoods. I don't know the streets. I don't know any of that stuff. With the advent of tools and online data today, it's so simple to go into any market and say, I want to I want to invest in Memphis, Tennessee, greater Shelby County, and I want to figure out, I want to grid the market. So back in 2012, so this is 11 years ago. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 11 years ago. I had to do math. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do math on the calculator <laughs> live, on, people, live on screen. <laughs> some people struggle with sixth grade math. Yeah. Isn't that what you said before? <laughs> 11 years ago, um, I created a training course that I taught people how to invest in multiple markets. And so... The, the the idea behind this was was fairly simple. Depending on the market you are living in, and this and this applies to today, right? It's the same reason I invest remotely today. Depending on the market you're living in, the amount of time, the amount of cost in marketing, uh, and the amount of effort it takes to get a deal in some cities, is significantly greater than in others. And so I distinguish between what I would call an easy profit city and not an easy profit city. And so, for example, Denver, it's a higher price market. Historically, it has booms and busts. And so I categorize markets, boom and bust markets. I categorize markets as cash flow markets. So you've got your boom and bust and your cash flow or price stable market. And so if we're thinking about what this means, a boom and bust market is a, is a market that appreciates greatly and then crashes at some point in the cycle. And then it appreciates and recovers, and then it crashes, and then it appreciates it, and then it crashes. And there's a historical trend uh, for that happening, a boom and bust market. A cash flow or a price stable market tends to not do that. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, appreciate greatly and then crash significantly. It price stable appreciates slowly and then through, the, through a crash or a downturn or a market economic shift, it depreciates maybe with a little bit of a drop and then kind of slowly, but then it comes back and it recovers. There's not these big massive swings. And so depending on the phase of the market cycle, like back in 2008 when the market crashed, when the boom of Denver went to the bust, I came back and we went all in in Denver because now I could buy at that discounted bust price and let the market recover over time and boom back to uh, an appreciated high value, which is exactly what it's done over the last decade. And, you know, there's a lot of factors that we don't have to 
get into all of the factors of why that recovery has happened. And, you know, financing plays a big piece of that. Interest rates plays a big piece of that. Uh, economic growth plays a big piece of that. Uh, pandemic pays, plays a piece of that. Like there's a, there's a lot of things that drive the microeconomic changes in any macro bigger uh, city. And so it, back in 2008, to late 2007, early 2008, the boom crashed to the bust. We came back into Denver. We rode it back up. And then as the market tightened up, as inventory got purchased by investors, prices started to go up over time. And people always ask me this question, how do I know where the bottom is? And Cash flow investors will usually predict the bottom of any market. And so let me explain this. If prices go from, and we'll just use some easy math. Let's say prices go from $200,000 house down to $175,000 house, down to $150,000 house, down to $125,000 house, down to $100,000 house through a crash. The, the market is crashing. The question that has to be asked is, at every price tier, as it's going down, how far is the bottom? Is it going? If I buy it at a hundred, is it going to go to twenty-five thousand, and I'm going to lose seventy-five thousand dollars worth of value? Most people would say, I don't know how to predict that. There's no way to predict the bottom. I'll tell you how to predict the bottom. The way you predict the bottom is you look at it from a cash flow perspective, and and an investor says, if I buy it at a two hundred thousand dollar house. And I can get uh, negative $100 a door cash flow. That's, that's my, my top retail. That's the boom part of the, the cycle. It's negative cash flow. Prices are high. Uh, it's, it's a retail buyer's market. Then it goes down to $175,000. It starts the crash. It starts that slippery slope down. And it goes to one hundred seventy five, dollars and all of a sudden it's a, it's a break-even cash flow. And then it goes down to one hundred fifty, dollars and it's a plus $100 a month cash flow. Then it goes down and it keeps going down. And with every and with every step down, there's an increase in the net cash flow to an investor. OK. And so the variable there is the is the rent. What is the rent doing as prices are coming down? Are rents staying stable? Are rents going up? What are rents doing in comparison to price? And rents are the driver of that cash flow. So with every step down in value, cash flow increases. So an investor starts to say, am I willing to take $200 a door net positive cash flow? Nah, I think, I think it's still going down. Uh, am I willing to take $300, $500, $600, $700? And then all of a sudden it gets down to an investor says, you know, prices are coming down and prices are coming down because the retail buying activity is not there. Investors are a little unsure. So prices keep stepping down because the, the buying activity has not started yet. And as soon as the prices get down to a place where an investor says, you know what, $800 a door, I'm in the buying frenzy starts or the buying activity starts. And it's at $800 a door that the buying activity starts. So what you have to predict is at what cash flow value will an investor say, that's cheap enough, I'm willing to buy and turn that into cash flow. And so if $800 net positive cash flow per door is the floor, the buying activity starts. As soon as the buying activity starts, there's competition amongst investors. As soon as there's competition amongst investors, one guy says, you know what? I don't need $800 a door. I'm happy with $750 a door. So the floor on price just started to ease itself back up because cash flow if I pay a little higher price, my cash flow is reduced slightly, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with $750 a door, not $800. And then somebody says, you know what? I don't need $750 a door. I'm okay with 700 
And then somebody comes in and says, I, you know what? I don't need $700 a door. I'm okay with 600 And so that's how you predict and forecast the bottom of any market. Where are investors going to start buying with the cash flow, start to create the demand, and then create effectively a bidding war against themselves to bring the price back up? So I tell you that background story to, to tell you when you start investing virtually, sometimes you're looking at your own local market and saying, wow, where we sit today with historically low interest rates, even though they've been coming up a little bit over the last six months to nine months, historically low interest rates, right? I, I, I still find it funny, people that complain about six, seven, eight percent interest rates 20 years ago, uh, like the the idea that that six percent interest rates are so high, I can't invest in real estate uh, floors me. That just shows a lack of knowledge or skill. That's fine. We can we can teach over that. But interest rate movements, price movements, and we're in a boom phase of the cycle macroeconomically, right? Kind of every market, even your price stable markets, are up. And so every market is up. And from the up, where do they typically go? At some point, there's a peak. And when they hit the peak, then they turn and they go back down. There's a cycle that happens. So people get a little bit scared to sometimes buy in the peak. So when we're in the peak, and let's say that you live in a Denver that's boom and bust, you probably don't want to buy into negative cash flow today as an investor, or you have to put so much money down and then you risk losing that value and your equity gets erased over time, you move to another market. You move to a price stable market and you invest for cash flow and you invest for the long term there. You keep your capital moving. Um, money, money loves velocity. And so keep your capital moving and go into a virtual market and make a better investment than you could in your local market. From a wholesaler's perspective, okay, from, from a guy or gal who's out there pounding the streets, uh, running marketing, and, and turning over rocks, finding deals, the amount of time that it takes you in a virtual market, if you select the virtual market well, to find a deal and get to a payday is significantly shorter with significantly less marketing investment cost than in a boom bus market at the top of, of the boom side of the cycle. And so th these are just some ideas and some things to be thinking about. Why would you go somewhere else? To protect against the bust, number one, to keep your capital flowing and moving and, and your investment game sharp, number two, and to maximize your cash flow even in the upper swing of the market while, again, simultaneously protecting the downside because you're doing it in a price-stable environment. So, and fourth would be as a wholesaler going into a market that is what I would call an easy profit city where the, the time to deal and the cost to deal is significantly shorter than another area. And so let me tell you guys why, where I figured this out, and then I'll let you guys chime in. But I'm on a roll, so I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> it's that energy drink. Uh, this is this is Zevia. <laughs> it's Zevia Cola. It's zero calories, no sugar. Rob, we know you dump out the Zevia and put Red Bull in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so let me let me tell you where this came from. Years ago, when I got into this business, I learned how to wholesale. And I, I just took massive action. I just did. I just I failed forward. I asked questions. And by failing forward, asking questions, I succeeded. And I had no paralysis analysis. I had, I had the mindset that let me go stub my toe. Let me, let me walk into the, the very clean sliding glass door and smack my face and figure it out. And so that's what I did. And I, I'll tell you that most of the time I didn't stub my toe and I didn't walk into the sliding glass door. 
most of the time I succeeded and, and I made money through that process. But because of that, the, the company that I learned from years ago, the, the education seminar company that I learned from, um, had this thing back in the day, hey, fax us in your checks. And so I was faxing in copies of checks, my testimonials, right? And I was faxing them in. And they called me one day and they said, hey, if you keep faxing in copies of your checks, you're going to break our fax machine. What are you doing? They asked. And I said, well, what do you mean what am I doing? I'm That's doing my favorite part of the story. When the coaching company coaches a student and then the student sends in checks that they're doing and then the coaching company calls the student and says, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing exactly what you <laughs> taught me to do was, was that. my answer. Right. And long story short, I realized that they um, d didn't really understand differences of markets. And, and, and I will tell you, back in that day, when I first got started, I was doing it in Denver. And so this was this was the boom before the current boom. This was the boom before the 08 crash and the recovery where we are today. And so Denver was a very different market than, say, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, or uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Denver was a boom market in the boom side of the, of the cycle. And so the strategies that I was using were, were much more creative. It wasn't just an all-cash offer at a discount. I was using creative strategies. I was using lease options and owner financing, and I was solving problems at higher prices um, with, with cash flow problems that owners had, more so than I was solving significantly discounted or distressed properties at a, at a massive uh, price reduction. And so... Um, I was I was back there in in 08 and I figured this out. I was having this conversation before 08 this is about 01 or 02. This seminar company comes to me. Ultimately, I start coaching for them, and I ended up traveling the country, East Coast to West Coast, Canada to Mexico. Every other week, I flew somewhere and spent three to four days with a new student. And I would get off the airplane and they would pick me up. And as humans do, there's an immediate judgment, right? The guy that picks me up dressed in a sharp suit, driving a 7 Series BMW, you think to this, you think to yourself, oh, this guy's going to succeed. Then the guy that picks me up in a beat-up, crappy Chrysler minivan and dirty blue jeans because he was out being a plumber earlier that morning, you look at him and you say, he might struggle. What I found is that there was zero correlation between the success of the student that I was teaching at the time and how they showed up. And it almost all had to do with the market they were in. Without question, it had to do with the market they were in. And I started to see patterns. The guy in the 7 Series Beamer in an expensive, high-priced, boom market at the top of the cycle that it was going to take an investment of marketing over time to get that one lead that was going to close. The profit might be bigger on that one deal they closed, but were they going to have the, the guts to stick with the marketing and keep spending money and keep generating leads until that one big profit deal closes? Or are they going to give up along the way? I found no correlation to the 7 Series Beamer or the beat-up Chrysler minivan and who had success. The 7 Series guy in, a, in an easy profit city had success. The 7 Series guy in a high price market struggled. The beat up Chrysler minivan, the, the dirty blue jeans guy, had success in an easy profit city and struggled in a high price. So the correlation I started to make was the market makes more difference than the person, assuming they're doing similar things and applying the right strategies. But I watched this for about a year and a half or so, two years that I coached for this organization, and I got the chance to travel one, one city to the next every other week and experience a market, feel a market, see what a student did, teach the exact same thing every single time. And then I started to realize that if I wanted my students to have more success, I need to lean in 
I need to lean in on certain strategies in certain markets a little bit more and other strategies in other markets a little bit more. And then at the end of the day, I came to this realization that, you know, if I pick the easiest strategies that produce the outcomes that I want, whether that's cash generation or cash flow creation, if I pick the strategies that are the easiest and the most repeatable and I just go to the market that is giving that kind of deal to an investor and do repeatable things, I win. That's when the aha light bulb came, like struck me early in my investing career. And, and it's what formed the, the, the overall thesis of where we sit today. Were you aware as this was going on that your overall investing philosophy and thesis was being formed? I'm assuming you were at some point, but probably not early on. Not early I on. I wouldn't guess. Not early on because um, it seemed, well, I, I had a unique opportunity right, to travel the country and see different markets, literally get on an airplane and put boots on the ground in city to city to city to city, right? Um, and, and at the same moment in time, one week to the next, I got to see how different one city is than another. And there were some repeatable things that I noticed, right? Um, but there were some stark differences at the same time. And so I started to take note. I started to, to jot down ideas and thoughts. And it wasn't init initially, it was just curiosity and interesting. But then over time, it became the foundation for my approach to real estate investing as a whole. And you mentioned some of the differences, but my guess is you also got off in some markets and said, Hey, this, you know, blue collar working class neighborhood looks identical to the one I was in a month ago. And so, because, you know, what I've learned over the years is a C neighborhood in Memphis looks just like a C neighborhood in St. Louis, looks just like a C neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And so to, to be able to see that, and you were doing the non Google maps version cause it didn't exist. You were doing the airplane rental car or student pick you up. Let's go drive it version. Right. So, yeah. Not, not only the look of it, but the feel of being there, which you can't pick up on the computer. Yeah, you can't. I, and I was talking about, you know, it's the it's the see it, um, smell it, feel it, hear it thing that that happens when you get on the ground in a market. And so if if I'm going to go into a market and invest and build a portfolio in that market. So let me back up. If I'm going to wholesale just for cash creation. I'll never visit that city. Um, I'll never go there. Um, if I'm going to start deploying capital into that market in a in a bigger way, there's a good chance I'm going to get in the plane and fly out there and and check it out. Um, not always. I, I have bought a lot of real estate uh, in my portfolio that is sight unseen by by me. Somebody saw it, and somebody told me what they see, what they see, what they smell what they feel, what they hear when they walk the, the house, when they walk the neighborhood, when they walk the thing. But, but you're, you're right, Mike. Uh, you know, I always say this, you know, front door is a front door is a front door. And a kitchen's a kitchen's a kitchen. And so th there, are some, there are some nuances as to in a particular geographic region of the country, you know, in, in some area, you just got to have a basement. And you want to figure that out and you want to know that, ooh, this, this house over here that I could buy doesn't have a basement, but everybody in this geographic reason, region wants a basement. And so that non-basement house might be a weird, an, an anomaly. It might feel totally normal to where you live, but in this area where you're investing, you'll figure that out. And I like to figure that out as a wholesaler. I like my my local buyers, I like local buyers to tell me I'm not going to buy that house at that price because it doesn't have a basement. Now, price cures everything. So I just have to buy that non-basement house that much cheaper. But you figure that out as a wholesaler uh, going, going into a market, launching, and then, and then learning through the process. You made an important point real quick that I want to circle back on you made the comment if i'm gonna wholesale i don't really care i don't need to go there i can't tell you how many people we've coached 
who they've told me their intent is to wholesale, but then through conversation, they won't wholesale in a city or a neighborhood because they would never consider them buying a house there themselves. Right, right. This came up, I was talking to somebody three hours ago. And can we just be really clear? If you are buying a property that you want to own, let your preferences come into the equation. If you are strictly wholesaling, and Rob, you taught me this years, it was like day one or two stuff. If there are buyers with a demand in the area, let's go wholesale and deal. It is completely irrelevant whether or not we would buy there. Yeah. Like 100% irrelevant. Right. Just go where the money's being made. Get your preferences out of it. Now, you want to go buy a rental property? Let your preferences get involved. Exactly. But and, to just to wholesale, I'm, I just bring it up because people get stuck on this over and over. I would never buy that house next. And then right, an experienced wholesaler comes in and says, thank you for passing on that one. Let me go make 10 grand now. Yeah, that's right. And I want to just caveat. I, I, I want to caveat the idea that you should let your personal opinions become part of your investment thesis what what are what are you trying to do are you trying to live in the house or are you trying to make money right and so there are houses that i own in neighborhoods that i own in that i may not want to live in but that's okay it's a great little house it's safe it's functional it's clean it provides value to the neighborhood i keep it i keep it uh, updated and it produces a stream of income. And so I, I always, you know, I, I totally know where your, where your point was, but I want to caution people. Don't let your bias come into your investment strategy, right? Um, because too many people prevent themselves. Now the, the bias, uh, I, I'll give you an example. Like, my my bias that has investment basis i'll bring into my theory okay i don't like houses that have i don't like i don't like a single family house on an acre that's not that's not the house i want in my rental portfolio because when it does go vacant it's going to cost me 250 300 bucks to have somebody go mow it it's a pain in the butt i don't want a lot of land associated with my single family thousand square foot rental house. So that that cracker box house on an acre, somebody might look at and I see it all the time. Wholesalers are like, you know, three bedroom, two bath on an acre with 50 exclamation points. And I'm like, yeah, next. <laughs> yeah. I like that's my investment bias coming in mm -hmm. saying I don't I don't even want that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's that's showing me that that wholesaler doesn't understand what an acre means. An acre means it's going to cost me more. Maintenance. It doesn't mean yeah. that I'm going to rent it for more or or increase my value significantly. It means it's going to cost me more. Well, that, they're posting it in a terms of what you were saying, their preferences. Yeah. They feel like an acre is right. beneficial. Yeah. And it very well may be to them for themselves and their family. Right. And so, I mean, I, I, I fell into this trap. I, I mean, you called me out a couple times on a couple of the first wholesale deals that I had. And I, and I, I was drawing attention to things that did not matter. Yep. Um, that, that to someone like you or now me, it just doesn't matter. Right. It's not that big of a deal. How much, how much money can I make from, from this house? You know, how, how much money can I make? How am I going to make money? Right? Do I have to buy it and immediately resell it? Do I have to buy it, renovate it, and resell it? Can I buy it and rent it? Do I have to buy it, renovate it, and rent it? Like, how am I going to make money? If if uh, a wholesaler can help a local investor or uh, an out of state investor answer that single question, how do I make money on this house? A wholesaler wins, and mm -hmm. then obviously the investor that's buying it wins because they can now go execute on that exit strategy. So yeah, and wholesaling in in that scenario, especially for me, is if you go if you're going into a virtual market with no plans whatsoever to make the next step towards passive cash flow, right? Yeah. Um, going into that market and learning more and more about it, you 
you'll gradually start to see and realize that, you know, there's potential just past wholesaling in that market. If you're in the right virtual market, like we're talking about in this scenario, um, the more wholesale deals you do, the more houses that you look at, the more pictures that get taken, um, you start to build, like Mike said, your, your personal preference on where you feel like you personally can make um, the type of money that you want to be making with your rentals. Yep. And the cool thing about building those relationships and learning about that market is you'll find out where you'll continue to wholesale and then we'll, where you'll cherry pick for yourself. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a it's a beautiful thing to, to learn everything there is to know about um, all the zip codes, all the counties in this market. Um, yep. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about how technology has impacted the ability for someone to invest virtually. And, and I think here in a minute, maybe we'll we'll just pull up Freedom Soft and just show some of the things that we do to launch. And, you know, this is just as a as a precursor a little bit to our virtual market challenge. And we're going to go deep uh, into it. But I, I want to give people sort of this understanding and idea uh, about how the tools and technologies are available and designed to help you do this stuff. And so we'll lean into that in a, in a minute. I think we've also talked a little bit about some of the benefits of, of why to invest virtually. Here's a question that, that I think um, is probably looming around in someone's head. How do you guys think the, um, the uh, COVID scenario has impacted people investing virtually, ha has impacted or or biased them in one direction or another, or, or do you think that it has? Do you think that COVID has changed people's approach to investing virtually, or do you think it's just the same and it's just another mark in the timeline? I think partially it... COVID could have been a side effect of allowing people to not see these properties or not feel like they need to be visiting these properties just because maybe they weren't allowed to at the time. Mm -hmm. And it may have broken down just some barriers when people, you know, like what Mike said, people feel like they have to be there or know everything there is to know about that area and have to live there. Um, so that, that very well may have been a side effect. Yeah. I agree. I agree with yeah. that. I mean, chiming in from over here, <laughs> like <laughs> I, I looked right there for a second, and you weren't there. <laughs> but Who's I talking? totally. Where, where is he? Uh, it's the ghost from beyond. Uh, it's the wholesale ghost. Uh, <laughs> I, I totally <laughs> think that that had a big shift in people's mindset because every job, all of a sudden, you had to do remote. You know, whether you were a teacher, which at the time I was, um, teaching seventy kids science on Zoom. Um, teaching art on Zoom. I mean, it was it was intense. So I think just the flip in mindset to say, oh, we can do jobs from our houses p puts a big, like, jump forward in everybody's mind to say that this is doable. I, I don't have to go walk it. I can do that from my computer here. You know, I, I hadn't actually thought about it from that perspective. M maybe I did, but it wasn't like the thing that came to the front of my brain when I when I think about uh, when I think about this um, wh which is the, which is the positive spin to put on it. it 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 forced people to say how do I do this without going to the house right I no longer can just go there so how am I going to continue to be a real estate investor and make money and do this stuff the, where where my brain went to was a little bit more it showed me clearly what states and what cities I don't want to invest in real estate in. Now, would I wholesale there? Yeah. But usually I'm going to pick a city that I want to wholesale in that ultimately I would consider and be interested in buying and holding in for, for the portfolio long term. So the response to COVID, to me, clearly put a map in front of me that says, not there. Not there, not there, because, frankly, crazy mayors and crazy governors that tell me I can't do X, Y, or Z, or that somebody can live in my house and not pay me, that's ridiculous. Insane. But 
I'm going to stay on the positive side. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> I think what we've learned is that it taught people how to do things in a way that they otherwise maybe felt uncomfortable in doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, in general, just I'm sorry. In, in general, wholesaling in a market for a bit, uh, even before that, um, with, without even thinking about that, allows you to learn more about the rules and regulations right. that each municipality, each city, each county holds yep. uh, to themselves. So, um, again, you can wholesale successfully in counties that have a lot of rules, right? Absolutely. There are still investors that have taken that risk um, because for some personal preference, yep. still wholesale, yep. but you can figure out, you know, that may not be for me, Yep. but you can still wholesale though there. Yeah. In, in the back of your head, I'm going to let you go in a minute, but in the back of your head, come up with a city, come up with a city name in a minute that, that I'm going to, that we're going to go to in freedom soft in a minute. Mike, take it away. I'm going to bring this back negative. <laughs> yes, <laughs> do it. <laughs> I've talked to way more people that said then COVID happened and I got out as opposed to then mm-hmm. COVID happened. I realized I couldn't travel and I learned how to re- invest re- uh, remote. I, maybe, maybe there's some that spun this that direction. I think most people took it as I can no longer travel. I'm done. I was trying to do this over here. I live here. I was trying to do this over there. Even if it was the next city over, like I'm out. Yeah. Good. So I've heard that over and over. Yeah. And so ahead of the next challenge in this virtual market, just let me throw this in and then, you know, take it back. But I'm excited for just like barriers were knocked down in the hundred offer challenge. For those of you that are going to go through both of these challenges back to back, you're you will if you go through either or your business will be forever changed. If you go through both, it'll be double forever changed, if that's not even a thing. (laughs) But now you blow past the offer barrier, and then you learn how the entire country is your playground. And what you're about to show here in FreedomSoft, Rob, you could, and I was almost thinking when you do the challenge, we should blindfold you and throw a dart at the map (laughs) and say that's where we're going to go. Just pick the nearest area. Yeah. Because it literally is that fast and easy. Totally. That, you know, this old saying, well, throw a dart. Okay, let's throw a dart. Yep. You can go anywhere, get a lay of the land, figure out what's going on. What you had to do previously with students is buy a plane ticket, fly to the city. They pick you up, and then you had to drive all these zip codes out, what, a day and a half? Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, you can do it in Google Maps, but you don't have to spend three hours zooming around Google Maps. You can go to this tool in FreedomSoft called ZipFinder, and it'll tell you exactly where the investor activity is. Yep. And once you see that, you know exactly what the neighborhood looks like. Well, once you pick the market, which through through the virtual market challenge, we're going to teach you how to approach picking a market yep. and identifying an easy profit city. And from there, it's, it's, it's gridding out the market and answering a couple of questions. I, I want to know um, what are investors buying? Where are they buying? What price are they paying? And then who are they? Yep. So if I can answer those four questions, once I pick a market, once I once I figure out inside that market where investors are making money, and then I can answer those four questions, I'm, I'm on it. Like, I'm on it so fast. So give, give me a city. Give, give me a city that we're going to start with. Dayton, Ohio. Okay, Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio, Mike, do you, you uh, confirm that one, or what, what do sure, you say? That's fine. All right, Dayton, Ohio. All right, so here, here's what we're going to do. Did what, you have what a better it? one? Henry, every response that you give, I have a better <laughs> response, but Dayton's fine. <laughs> Just setting them up, lay up. <laughs> that, was, that was a softball <laughs> over the plate, <laughs> man. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna go Dayton, Ohio. Now let me ask you this: Why did you pick Dayton, Ohio? You told me to. You just said spin a random city in my head. Okay. Did um, I know nothing about Dayton? Ohio. I, I was gonna ask you: Do you know anything about Dayton, Ohio? Was had you worked with a FreedomSoft customer recently that was investing in Dayton? Maybe. What, what made Dayton I, stand out to you? May I maybe have come across a a student or a user that. Is from there, but okay. n- no, 
there's no motive here. I, I've this was just a rant. I've I played against a college team there when I was okay. in college. <laughs> so date so Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> so for those of you listening and not watching, I have Freedom Soft pulled up on the screen. Those of you on on YouTube, uh, you can watch along as we as we do this. But what did I say? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick a city, and in the uh, virtual market challenge, we're going to we're going to teach you how to evaluate whether Dayton, Ohio is a good choice. So that's the first question you have to ask. We, we randomly picked a city, Dayton, Ohio. The first thing we would want to do is validate whether that city is a good choice. And in the virtual market challenge, we're going to teach you how to validate and, and come to that conclusion. You're going to be able to answer that question for every city in the country with a very systematic process. So we're going to, we're going to not dive into how we do that today. We're just going to assume Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. So we're going to start there because the next question that we want to do is we want to figure out how to grid that market. And we want to figure out what, where are investors making money in that market? Because the answer to this is in every market in the country, every city in the country, investors are making money. The question is, number one, on the, on the city selection and confirmation side, is it what we would call an easy profit city? And then on the grid side, where are they making money? So in FreedomSoft, we go to the first tool in the Tools tab, and we go to ZipFinder. And ZipFinder's job is to point you to where investors are making money in any city. So we're going to go here, and we're going to go down to Ohio. And I'm just going to pick Ohio. And I'm going to go ahead, and I'm just going to do the city, and I'm going to type in Dayton instead of doing the MSA. Uh, you know what? Actually, let me, let me back that up. I'm going to do the MSA. I'm going to do the Metropolitan Statistical Area because that's going to get the Dayton, the city of Dayton, and all of the surrounding suburbs – because maybe when you say Dayton, it's actually Elgin. And I don't know if that's a suburb of Dayton. Maybe it's Elgin where all the investors are buying. So I'm going to pick the MSA. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to find the Dayton, Ohio Metropolitan Statistical Area. So the MSA is, is bigger than the county, which is bigger than the city. So there are multiple cities inside of a county. There can be multiple counties inside of an MSA. So I'm going to go with the geography, Dayton, Ohio, but the largest selection of geography, which is the MSA. And then I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go to the last 180 days. So in the last 180 days, I want to know where investors are making the money, and I'm going to click search. Now, what ZipFinder is doing is it's looking now into the data. It's pulling all of the public records data that we analyze inside of FreedomSoft, and it's throwing it onto a map inside the, the greater Dayton MSA. And you can see here that it's got Dayton. It goes up to Troy. It goes up to, what is that, Pigua. Um, so th this MSA is beyond just the metropolitan area. It extends a little bit. I'm going to zoom in, and I'm going to zoom sort of into, we can see that Dayton, uh, this, here's the Dayton International Airport up here on the top of the map, and we can see these, these bubbles. And if I click this, we have the zip code 45424. We have 220 investor transactions, investor sales, uh, in the last six months, this is the number one, this is the top investor activity zip code in the Dayton area, and that is in Huber Heights. It's the northeast section of Dayton, Ohio. Okay, right, right below that, oops, let me not zoom out. We've got the second one, which is 45417. So we've got 174 investor sales. So 174 investor transactions in the last six months in this zip code alone. So this is the second largest zip code. Now, I can just go right down this list off on the right-hand side, and I can, I can find selection one, two, three, four, and five. I can go pick the top five zip codes where investors are making deals happen. 
Now, I still haven't. I, I'm starting to answer. Okay, we've we've done confirmation of Dayton. We haven't talked about how we do that, but that's what we would do. We're starting to grid the market and say where are investors making money. The software is doing it for us. You can see that if you're watching this on on uh, YouTube, uh, you can just listen if you're you're on the podcast. And we've identified the top five zip codes. We could do the top five. We could do the top 10. Let's just stay with the top five for right now. And now we have to start asking the question, who's buying? What are they buying? Where are they buying? And what price are they paying? Once we can start to answer those questions, we can go in and we can make money. And so let's go ahead and let's just click find sellers. I'm going to click the find sellers box. It's going to pull from zip finder right into the lead finder tool in FreedomSoft. And we're going to go from the geography info into the, the list building. And now we can build absentee owner lists. We can build owner occupied lists. You'll notice right here, this tired landlord list. Uh, I think on previous shows, we've talked a little bit about Henry, how you have used the tired landlord list right out of FreedomSoft to create a steady stream of deal flow from one seller that just sells you a house, you you help them, you make money. They come back, they sell you three more, you, you help them, you make money. And they come back and they create a, a stream. And so we've got tired landlord, we've got high equity, distant landlord, vacant properties. Let's just go ahead and start with the with the vacant property list here and, and click search. And what you guys are going to see is that in these targeted areas where investors are making money, in those top five zip codes, we just we just built a list of 1,916 available properties, which I'm going to select all, and I'm going to add to a lead list. And so I'm just going to name this lead list in FreedomSoft, and I'm just going to call this uh, Dayton, Ohio. And I, here's how I like to do it. I like to mark it as a seller, um, and then I like to put the word list so I can just quickly see it. Seller, S for seller, list, Dayton, Ohio. And then I'm going to put uh, vacant, and I'm going to leave it right there. Workflow automation, we're going to leave our standard workflow automation, list permissions, I won't change that. And I'm just going to build my list. And so for those of you in the 100 Offer Challenge, you, you now know what to do with this list. Yep. Right? You're in the, you're in the, you're in the game instantly. For those of you that are uh, listening to this right now or watching this and haven't gone through the 100 Offer Challenge, what I'm what I'm here to tell you is from this list, you have opportunity to make money immediately. And we're going to expose some of that through the virtual market challenge and show you guys, once you do the, the market validation, once you grid the market and figure out where investors are making money, and then I'm going to show you how to start answering those questions of who's buying, where are they buying, what are they buying, what price are they paying, we start to make this whole concept of virtual investing palatable. It feels good. It feels safe. It's it's so simple. And so what we're doing here is we're, we're letting this prospect list build. Now, I want to go back and I want to just show you guys one other thing because uh, let me go back two tabs, back all the way here, back to our zip finder tab. And in those same top five zip codes, look at the other button I could push. I can push find buyers. I, I can find active buyers or I can find cash buyers only. I typically preference to finding the active buyers because the active buyers includes cash, but it also includes if you use private money. It also yep. includes if you use hard money. It also includes if you use traditional financing. So I like to see active buyers, but what, what Lead Finder there did is it it kept your ge geography selection out of Zip Finder. So now we're going to start to answer the question, who's buying? What are they buying? Where are they buying? What price are they paying? Because we're going to build a list of the active buyers. I've got 809 active buyers in that area. Right, and that's over the last six months. And that's over the last six so these months. These aren't people that bought 20 years ago. That's right. These are the ones buying now. That's right. These are these are people buying right now in these zip codes. Yeah, each of each of these pinpoints on the map are properties that those buyers acquired 
And then when you build this list now, you're going to get every single entity that bought those houses. Um, so what, what I actually like to do here, Rob, is I always remind people is like your number there was, I think was 880, for yep. example. And I think this is going to prove your point, but this is, I explain it most of the time while you're doing this, the number that you're about to get on the screen here is not going to be 880. That's right. 99% of the time. And I usually ask people why, and yep. some people know, some people don't. The reason here is going to prove your point on how popular this market is, is multiple of these people purchase multiple of those results. That's right. That you, that you just search for. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and so, uh, we're going to, we're going to wrap here shortly. Um, but well, there it is. So here's our, here's our list. 681. Here's so. our buyers list, 681 unique buyers. And so now watch this. Let's just click into these 681 and let's go do a filter. And I, I just want to show you guys because I think this is so cool. And we're going to dive it deep so into cool. this, you know, freedomsoft.com forward slash join the challenge. If you want to go through the virtual market challenge with us and see how we do this and, and how this makes you money, go to freedomsoft.com forward slash join the challenge. And we're going to dive deep into this. I'm giving you like a super flyover quick. And but not if they want to join, go flip and sign up. Yeah, go. Yeah, go join. It's free. That's like right. we're doing this. We're doing this stuff for free. Oh, yeah. And so. If I if I go to this add a filter, I can go down, and I'm gonna go all the way down to the bottom, and I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say purchase properties. I'm gonna say let's find the people who have purchased I don't know who have purchased three in the last six months, okay? Uh, and this is we're gonna go after. Let's see on on or after, and we'll go six months ago. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll just select since the beginning of the year. Hey, Rob, instead of equals, do uh, equals oh, or greater than. Yeah, that's right. Uh, greater than or equals. Yeah, so, so this, now is we're three, this is three or more now. Three or more. Or more. Greater right. than or equals. They, so these are the people that have bought three or more. Yep. Okay. And let's see how many that is. I've got 49 people, 49 unique investors that have bought three or more properties. You guys starting to see the picture? In those top zip codes. In those top zip codes. So what, what, what you didn't talk about there was how do we evaluate whether the distressed inventory levels are at a high enough in those top zip codes? But we're, we're going to show you that in the challenge. Yep. And, and so here, let's go five. 26. We went from 49 to 26. Let's go. How many bought 10 or more? No, right. I've got 10 investors that have bought 10 or more properties in those top five zip codes in the last six months. Now, I'm not even going to show you if I clicked into these, I could show you their entire portfolio and I could show you how to start answering those questions. That's what we're going to go through in the challenge. Right. We're not even going to cover that right now because man i wanted you to do that i know it's, it's so, so cool it's so good it's so good <laughs> cliffhanger it's so good but it like because we could come over here and on the on this on this uh list that we just built we could go in and we could do some advanced filtering here on this list in freedomsoft and we can find the money and we're going to show you how to do that in the virtual market challenge <laughs> that's free it's free so here's what we have to do now. Though we got to wrap this up, we're already running long, and uh, and and we got it. We got to bring this to an end. Uh, let's go over here and let's get down to our next section in this thing. And let me go. Boom! There it is. Throw this up on the screen. You got uh, it. Gentleman <laughs> who's driving the, the buttons. <laughs> the guy that we can't. We got to get into yep. the mogul meme section, and we're going to get through this because this is the segment that has investors laughing. And as we've said in the past, we're not sure if they're laughing at us or with us, but we really don't <laughs> but, care. Well, we don't care. That's right. <laughs> That's right. All right. So the mogul memes, man. I, like, how can we go that fast from here's how you make money, and then sh clicking buttons and showing them how to do it to laughing? <laughs> I guess we can. We can. Yeah. People hey. just have to freedomsoft.com forward slash join the challenge. Join the challenge. And we're going to take you through the whole thing. So yeah, well, let's do it. All right. Here we go. I stopped believing the news. <laughs> I made more money in real estate. <laughs> Fact. <laughs> this is the more you know guy. Charlie the Murphy. More, the more you know, the more you know. That is a fact. 
yep. pointing at the gray matter on the in, inside of his head, finger on the temple, saying, "Ah, the more you know, I stop believing the news." Friends, turn off the news. I I did this one. I bet you guys had no idea. I bet you guys know I had, I had no idea that I was going to rail on the on the mainstream yeah, media. Big surprise, <laughs> shock. All right, all right. We'll go to the next one because that. All right. <laughs> when the follow up starts paying off. <laughs> this, okay, was mine. Do this, one. <laughs> this was mine. This was mine. And th this came from because I uh, <laughs> I just got a call back on a house in in uh, Memphis that I'm working Ooh. so. <laughs> I like it. When the follow-up starts paying. You got to describe it, though. What are we looking at? Uh, this is, um, I don't, I forget where this guy was an actor in, but um, a guy in a nice yellow suit peeking out from behind the tree, like rubbing his hands, just like, hmm, yeah, I know what I'm getting. I'm, I'm, I'm getting some money. Yeah. Go get that bag. <laughs> I like it. Okay, next one. Next one. Okay, here we go. I told, okay, this is, uh, uh, what is it? West Coast Wait, Choppers? No, yeah. this or, was, or, uh, Orange County Choppers. Orange, Orange, County. Orange, County. <laughs> Orange County Choppers. This is okay. Paul Sr. yelling at Paul, <laughs> Paul Jr. <laughs> Paul Sr. yelling at Paul Jr. I told you to make the offer. I don't know what price to pay. I told you to offer 60% of the Zillow value. It can't be that easy. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this show. Oh, jeez. Uh, that was their relationship, too. I mean, it was back and forth all the time. Oh, my gosh. It can't be that easy. He's <laughs> chucking a chair across the office. I so I, I did I made this one and I couldn't stop laughing <laughs> when I was doing this one. <laughs> but isn't Freedom Soft just a CRM? Wake up, son. <laughs> Which I think we proved in the last segment. Yeah, like, so this is Robin saying to Batman, but isn't Freedom Soft just a CRM? And then Batman's slapping him. Wake up, son. Like is, does Robin have a man bun? What is going on with does. his hair? I think he does. That's how hard he got slapped. Yeah. <laughs> knocks his hair oh right gosh. off. Who made that one, Mike? Was that you? Yeah. I like it. That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> I'll follow the system. Me. So me. I'll follow the system. Me also. <laughs> was a dog just wrapped up in toilet paper, <laughs> figuring out. Not and this was following the system. Right. This was me, too. And this is, uh, let me ask you this, Rob. Why do you think people will dial into a system, and then what's the thing that just derails them, typically? Like, why do they end up halfway in, and they're tied up in everything, just confused? Oh, yeah. Isn't that the million that's dollar a question? Whole, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole show by itself, man. I. Like, I don't know. I, I think people have a hard time taking a deep breath, slowing down, and just saying, okay, what what do I got to do first? And then what do I got to do second? And then what, what do I got to do third? But if we were to unpack the psychology of that, mm -hmm. Fear. and we're going to be here until my little timer says, like, <laughs> 342. Oh, says next and week. this is not a Rogan podcast, so we're not going to go that long. Right. <laughs> Here's the next one. All right. Um, who who is this one? Okay. I don't know. This is mine. So, it's a car that missed the exit, and so there's a little bit of smoke, slamming on the brakes, trying to get off, and then, the uh, the street, the, the highway sign above it on the bridge above says "Money This Way," and it just says "When investors here were recently boarded up house." So, <laughs> just you know, screeching the tires to get off the highway and go see it. Dude. Yeah. Y you have no idea how like real this meme is, though. The first house I ever bought with owner financing, I was cruising westbound on 6th Avenue here in Denver, and this little red and white sign that said for sale by owner was stapled to like the, the power line post up above the off-ramp. I, I see it, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I, I slam on the brakes. I cut off Garrison. I go under. I, I land on Everett. And I walk up, I knock on the door, and this little old lady shows up. And I ultimately bought the house, owner financing, no money down. She paid me $2,500 at closing, plus play, paid the closing costs. Bam. I resold it on a lease option and put ten grand in my pocket before I even closed. Anyway, crazy. That, but all, that's all it exactly, took was a traffic violation, and oh, you ticked off a couple all drivers. It, all it took was a traffic violation. But that's, as soon as I saw that, that story popped in my head. I didn't necessarily mean for it to be that relevant, but you're welcome. <laughs> you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That was queued up. <laughs> All right, what do we got here? Whose is this? This is me. 
<laughs> so there's a, a glass container full of water that's leaking. And it says wholesaling opportunities, mentorship, cash flowing opportunities, community growth. But what if? And the what is that? The this is flex so tape guy? Yeah, this is like an infomercial <laughs> guy. Snapping flex where tape on it. Is it is the basically <laughs> like the, the tank is what you can get out of all, all of real estate. And then me or the investor is just going to slap some some quick tape over it to f- <laughs> plug the hole. Only, you know, it's just going to come out again. <laughs> the the version I, of the version of this one that I copied over was it, I was also you in the parking lot absolutely just crying <laughs> laughing it's uh the guy is corporate america and the water coming out is you know bad policies a uh, bad company uh environment and then the tape is, the is or something yeah the tape is pizza parties <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. Sealing it up. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh making fun of Rob. <laughs> Mike and Henry. Oh my gosh. That's pretty funny. <laughs> okay, this who's you, it? Henry? Who's right. gonna who's that'd, gonna jump in? That'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> so describe what it is for those not It's it's two bros uh coming into a handshake with each other on something that they find in common. With and, massive biceps. And the thing that they find in common is making fun of Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Picking uh, on the boss. I yeah. like it. Yep. All right. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. We got a <laughs> picture of Bernie Sanders on the screen, and it says, and okay, so this is me, says in the upper left, owns million dollar mansions. Okay, now listen to this because I'm let's guess, hope this I'm, is uh let's hope this is queued up into the mixer from your computer. All right, let's let's hope. Let's see. Ah, uh, dang it. It's not. It's not. So okay. You got to just do it. Do, right. do say, it. Once again, I'm asking for you. Okay. So this is this is Bernie Sanders. Then below, it says, um, I got to figure out how to just see this. Uh, let me do this. I'm going to stop it right here at the end. Right there. Oh. <laughs> I think it's we gonna saw scroll. it. Yeah, well, it's going to scroll. I got to know what to read. I am asking you once t- again. Did, Did you, you make, make the, the offer? offer? Okay. There, pause. Okay. So we got <laughs> Bernie Sanders on the upper left that says, owns million-dollar mansions. And it says, I'm once again asking, did you make the offer? <laughs> okay. Now, here's... Is that Arnold or Bernie? This is, how, this is how he says it. This is what was queued up. So my, my audio that I sent along with this meme it, said... said my name is Bernie Sanders, and I'm once again <laughs> asking, did you make the offer? I did not purchase all of my million-dollar mansions without making the offer. <laughs> did you make the offer? It's like a cross between Bernie and Arnold. <laughs> hey, it's the best I got. Yeah, totally. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Like hey, it. if you like this one, uh, subscribe, smash that like button. Come on back next time. And share this on all of the places that you like to listen to content like this. So with that, that's a wrap. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Cheers.